Good evening, everyone. My name is Becky. I'm the uh, Programming and Collection Development Librarian here at Stores Library. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, welcome to Benefits of Home Composting. Uh, this is sponsored by Longmeadows Energy and Sustainability Committee and uh, the Gardeners on the Green. Um, Master Gardeners George Kingston and Dave Marinelli uh, will be discussing how you can reduce, reduce your carbon footprint and save money covering both indoor and outdoor composting with or without worms. Um, we're gonna start with George Kingston, who is a lifelong gardener. He has been a master gardener since 2001 and is a past president of the Western Massachusetts Master Gardener Association. He holds a PhD in engineering and is a retired research manager as well as the author of um, historical uh, biographies and is the vice chair on the East Longmeadow Planning Board. Um, followed by George will be Dave Marinelli, a lifelong avid gardener and trained as a master gardener in 2017. Um, he built his first compost bin in Longmeadow in 1988 and started worm, worm farming in 2016 um, in order to compost through the winter months and also maybe to gross out his granddaughters a little bit. Um, so thank you, George and Dave, for joining us tonight and presenting to our community. George, why don't you take it from here? Okay, can everybody see my slide, I hope? Um, this is about compost, and lest you think compost is a modern trend, i like to start out with a quote from Emile Zola, who was a uh, novel French novelist in the mid-19th uh, century, and he wrote a book called The Belly of Paris, or The, the Ventre de Paris, um, <laughs> And these quotes are from that. Madame Francois had a contract with the company that undertook the scavenging of the markets, and she carried off a load of leaves. Forked from the mass of refuse, it made excellent manure. Claude had quite a liking for manure, since it, it symbolizes the world and its life. The strippings and parings of vegetables, the refuse that fell from the colossal table, remained full of life and returned to the spot where the vegetables had previously sprouted to warm and nourish future generations of cabbages. Paris rotted everything and returned everything to the soil, which never wearied of repairing the ravages of death. And that's really what compost is all about. We use manure mainly to talk about animal waste, but manure really means to farm or to fertilize. And from that, we, it came to be known as waste use as fertilizer and animal waste use as fertilizer. A compost is a mixture of decayed organic matter. The word compost means mixture, and it includes both plant material and animal waste, depending on what you, you have available to you. What is compost? Okay, you need to think about the fact that, let's say tomato plants, you start out with this little tiny seed. It sprouts into seedlings and eventually grows up into this huge plant that has fruit on it and leaves and stems. Where did all that come from? Well, that material came out of the air in the terms of carbon dioxide, but also out of the soil. And the plants are concentrating nutrients from the soil to grow. So when they die and they rot, those nutrients are still there and that's what goes into compost. So it's a cycle. You start out with the plants, you plant them in well composted soil, they grow up, they die, and you make more compost out of it. That was exactly what Zola was talking about. It's important because it's concentrated plant materials, it's organic matter, provides texture to the soil, it, it provides moisture retention, and it recycles waste and reduces your need for fertilizer. If you compost all of your uh, organic materials, you will reduce the amount that you contribute to the waste stream. And that is why this is important for conserving energy. So how do you make compost? Well, quite frankly, compost happens. Uh, and that could be the end of the lecture. If you walk out into the woods in the summertime, you're not up to your knees in leaves usually. And that's because all the leaves that fell down last fall have been composted naturally in the woods. So compost happens whether or not we want it to. But you can speed the process by chopping things small, mixing them well, keeping them moist, aerating them, 
and turning the, the, the compost pile. That's what it means to make compost. Basically, you let nature take its course and you encourage it by helping things along. What to compost? Well, vegetable waste, obviously. Eggshells are great because they uh, provide calcium. Coffee, uh, coffee uh, grounds work well. Leaves work extremely well. Tea bags, bag and all. Paper, shredded paper, weeds, all of that works well, can be turned into compost. Those are the things that you should concentrate on. You can use animal waste. You've probably seen composted cow manure down at the Agway or A.W. Brown's. Chicken manure is really good for compost because it makes for very hot compost. It helps things rot well. If you have horses or if you have a friend who has horses, they probably are always trying to get rid of the manure from the horses. That also goes well into compost. Rabbits likewise, rabbit pellets go well into compost. The, the only thing with animal waste is that you've got to be careful to know where you're getting it from. You're getting it from healthy animals. Animal waste will help heat the compost pile. George, I think we lost your sound. Regular compost, because some of those pathogens may persist throughout the winter. Typically, uh, meat waste is not a good idea to compost or fats, because those attract critters. And unless you've got a big piece of property, you probably don't want critters in your compost pile, particularly if you have rats and mice in your vicinity, those are attracted to that. It, those things will compost, but they will attract critters. And poisonous plants, the one on the lower left there is poison ivy. You don't want to compost poisonous plants because some of those resins may persist in the compost. And that's not a good idea to be handling uh, composted uh, poison ivy. And then there's what won't compost. Well, actually, a lot of this stuff will compost, but probably not in your lifetime, or not in a couple years anyway. Sticks, pine cones, wine corks, rocks. Uh, Pachysandra is notorious for not composting. Uh, pits, uh, avocado skins, and corn cobs as corn cobs don't compost. They will compost if you grind them up, but if you just throw them in as corn cobs, They'll still be corn cobs a year from now. Likewise, those little stickers that come on all of your vegetables these days, uh, those will not compost and you will end up screening them out of the compost at the end. So if you don't put these things in, your compost will be easier to treat when you get around to, uh, to, to screening it. Now, this is for the scientists out there. There is a recipe for compost. It's two parts brown, leaves, chopped paper, one part green, grass and plants, a little bit of garden soil to get things going, two to four, make it in two to four inch layers alternating and water well. I know very few people who compost who actually do this, but this is the official recipe. The garden soil is there because compost happens because of organisms in the soil. In particular, funguses, fungi, and bacteria contribute greatly to the composting process. And the little bit of garden soil will contain, if it's good garden soil, will contain those organisms and they will grow and reproduce and work your compost pile. So if you wanna be scientific, this is the way to do it. The typical composter uses whatever they have and hopes for the best. Compost starter, you can buy it for 20 bucks uh, for a little bag. You don't need it. If you use some soil or some old compost to get it started, it'll, it'll go without that. This is useful if you're doing large scale um, composting, 
like they do at Bondi's Island. And by the way, you probably heard that the compost in Bondi's Island uh, spontaneously combusted. Well, if you're doing tons of compost, uh, the center of the pile may get that hot, but I have never heard of a home compost pile spontaneously combusting. So it's not something you really need to worry about, particularly because you wanna keep your compost pile moist. Temperature is important. You wanna to try to keep your, the center of your compost pile between 135 and 160 degrees Fahrenheit, which sounds hot, but actually a good working compost pile will get there easily. 150 degrees Fahrenheit will kill pathogens and weed seeds. If it's over 160, however, the biological activity will stop and the compost pile will go dead for a while. If it stops composting, the temperature will drop and when it gets under 160, it will start up again. If you'd like to monitor these things, you can buy a compost thermometer for not a whole lot of money at almost any garden center. Basically, it's a dial thermometer with a long um, probe on it and that probe you put into your pile and it will tell you the temperature of your, of your pile. That's good if you really wanna go out and diagnose how your pile is doing and try to maximize the rate of composting. There are some common compost problems. Nothing's happening. Uh, it's just sitting there. Well, the pile may be too small. You really need to have something on the order of if you, I mean, if you're not doing worm composting, you really need to have something on the order of at least three feet by three feet in order to get going. Um, larger is better. It may also be that the compost pile needs air because the bacteria that are working there, the ones that do the good work are aerobic bacteria, which means they need oxygen to, uh, to function. And if it's not any air in there, it, they won't, grow and, and do their job. It may need water. Uh, it, it doesn't, compost doesn't work in, in a dry situation. And typically what it really needs is turning. You need to get out there with a pitchfork and turn it over. If it smells, that's because it needs air and turning. The smell comes from anaerobic bacteria, bacteria that work when there is no air. And they're the ones that create the nastiness. So if you get air in there, they will die and the good ones will take over. It has bugs. Well, most compost piles will have bugs because you've got vegetables and things in there that bugs like to breed on. You can cover the pile, which helps. You can put leaves and grass over your fruits and vegetables, or you can put it in a place where the bugs are not gonna bug you. Um, they're just natural to, uh, to the pile. You may also get some critters in there. I once had a star-nosed mole living on the bottom of my compost pile. Um, that they're, they're for relatively harmless. Um, they don't really cause any problems. The deer like to come in and eat the stuff on the top of the pile. Um, all of that goes on, the squirrels get in there. As long as you keep the pile away from your house, uh, critters should not be a major problem for you. You can buy all kinds of composting devices. Uh, one of the uh, best gardeners I know, author of numerous gardening books, does what's on the upper left there. He uh, basically makes a big pile of leaves and other compostable material, starts at one end, piling it up. When it gets to as far as he can go on the other end, he goes back to the front end and starts digging it out. That's the simplest kind of composting you can do, and it doesn't cost you a dime. You can build wooden or buy wooden composting bins. You notice this one has three compartments. That's so that you can fill one with fresh stuff, let the, other, the, this, the next one actually do the composting and keep the, the third one be fully composted so it can stay there until you use it. There are these, I call them witches hats that were sold and may be sold again by the Departments of Public Works. They're basically large barrels, 
about three feet by three feet um, that you fill with compost. They have a uh, cone in the bottom that allows air to get into the pile. And they have a witch's cap on the top that keeps the pile covered. Uh, I don't use the cap because that way the rain keeps the pile wet and it does its thing rather nicely. Well, after it has fully composted, you basically lift the uh, cylinder off the pile, it collapses, and then you can screen it. There are also small um, ball-like things that you can kick around the lawn after you fill them with composting material. There are vermiform form uh, composters, which uh, David's going to talk about. And there are compost tumblers, which are useful if you are in a situation where you don't have a yard, you might want to put one of those on a back porch or something like that. Or if you're in an apartment and you want to compost and you have a, a patio of some kind, you can do that with the compost tumbler. It's a lot neater. It looks a lot nicer than a compost pile, um, but it does require you to get out there and turn it every couple of days. Some of these things are fairly expensive. The pile itself is, is is free. The ones you get from DPW are relatively inexpensive. So choose what works for you. Um, I use all. I use a pile for leaves. I use the witch's hat one for most of my composting. And I do have a compost tumbler um, that I use occasionally when I want to get compost to go quickly. Obviously, the more you turn your compost, the quicker the stuff is going to turn from raw material into compost. If you just leave it in a pile, it might take a year. But if you're talking about leaves that you pile up behind your shed, uh, that's fine because by springtime, when you want to put that compost on your gardens, it'll be available. Once you make it, you have to screen it because you will have rocks and twigs and things that just refuse to compost. The simplest way to do it is to take some two by fours, uh, make a frame and put some chicken wire over the, over the frame and then throw the compost onto there and rake it into a wheelbarrow. That's the technique I use. You can also buy screens that are uh, on the uh, a slant and you basically shovel your compost at the screen. It falls through and the good stuff is underneath. The, stuff that didn't compost rolls right off. There are also high-tech screens out there that you can spend lots of money for if you would like to do that. Um, again, that's up to you. There are many different ways to do compost uh, to screen it, but you do need to screen it to get the, bad, the stuff that didn't compost out before you try to put it in your flower bed. You can also do something called compost tea. Uh, this is something that um, Emily Dickinson did and, and wrote about. Basically what it, you do is you take a bag of compost and you put it into water and let it sit there and steep for a couple of days. You can do it simply by taking a uh, 55 gallon drum or a, a, a smaller drum, putting a, um, a faucet on the side and throwing in a burlap bag full of compost or even an old um, pillow case full of compost and just let it sit there and steep. That makes a liquid fertilizer that is very good for house plants and also for top dressing garden plants. It's easy to use and it's full of nutrients. People do sell high tech uh, compost tea makers um, that have pumps and aerate things and all that kind of thing, which you can find I'm sure on the internet, uh, but it's really as simple as putting a bag of compost into a bunch of water and letting it sit there. And then you just put it in your watering can and use it to fertilize the same way you would with any liquid fertilizer that you would buy in the garden center. How do you use compost? Well, uh, the general way to use it is you put it into your vegetable or um, Flower beds uh, as a fertilizer, um, it just basically work it in. You can also use it as compost tea or just as compost to top dress your vegetables after they are started to grow. 
You can use it as potting soil or mix it with potting soil uh, to, uh, again, to, to put plants in pots. Or you could use it on lawns. It is, makes a very good lawn fertilizer. Uh, if it's dry, it's spreadable uh, with a spreader. And uh, again, it, it's, it's basically free fertilizer that's out there for you to use any way you want, anytime you want. So basically compost happens, okay? It's black gold, it's easy to do, um, get out there and, and, and do it. This is the perfect time of year to start composting because you've got all those leaves uh, on your lawn or on your property. Find a place where you can make a pile out of them add your, your kitchen scraps to it and turn it now and then. And by next April, when you're ready to start getting back in your gardens, just brush the leaves, the, the leaves that haven't composted off the top, and you'll have this mass of black gold underneath that you can use to make your gardens great. And that's all I had to say. So I think I'm a little short on time. I was gonna do 25 minutes, I did 20, David gives you a few more minutes to get yours in. So thank you all. Thank you very much, George. That was great. Um, I'm used to talking in front of an audience, not so much on Zoom. I mean, I've done a couple of Zoom things, but I really like to get the feedback from people to find out, you know, do you compost now? Are you interested in starting composting? And if you're already doing regular composting, if you'd like to get started with worm composting, and that's why you're here today. So I'm hoping we're gonna have time at the end for questions for sure. And hopefully um, either through the chat box or uh, otherwise people will let us know, you know, if we've met your needs with the, these talks and um, you know, what your experience has been with composting. I know there are all different ways to do composting. I started, uh, comp I've used all different sorts of things like George described, the uh, the three bin system and just a, a pile in the yard and the black plastic uh, bin. But the thing that got me interested in doing worm composting is I got tired of carrying the kitchen scraps out to the yard in the winter. And uh, you know, that's, uh, they don't do much in the winter. It's so cold that the pile cools off and um, worm composting is an, is an excellent uh, solution for that problem. And actually it's gotten to the point now where I, even though it's a beautiful summer day, I'm still taking my kitchen scraps into the basement and giving it to the worms because um, it's easy and uh, the worms are happy and it doesn't smell and it, it, it's just a great solution. There are some limits, which I'll talk about but uh, composting with worms it, um, is what I'm talking about. And I wanna to try to emphasize um, the similarities and differences of outdoor, comp uh, outdoor composting. So um, I know that you're uh, all interested to uh, learn as much as possible, uh, but if you're like me, you're gonna go home and Google right away composting with worms. And when you do that, you're gonna come up with some wonderful resources. And you don't have to copy down these um, links because really all you have to do is search for composting with worms and a number of good websites will come up. And uh, one thing that master gardeners emphasize a lot is be careful where you get your information from. If you see a website that says .edu, you know, if it's a, an extension service for a university, that's gonna be reliable information. There are some exceptions out there. This one I thought was particularly good, this uh, learn.eartheasy.com. It's one of the first one that, that come up when you Google composting with worms. And I think they just have wonderful information about how to compost with worms. So uh, be careful when they say .com, often they're selling you something. You wanna emphasize the ones that say .edu, take a look at those first, and then you can explore some of the other ones. But keep in mind, uh, that the material may not be as well vetted there. Uh, this was the homepage of learn.eartheasy.com, how to compost in an apartment. And like I said, I, I thought that this was a very well done 
uh, website with lots of good information and no commercial anything. Um, this is the page that comes up when you go to the one I showed earlier. Um, it's actually, uh, it's a University of Oregon site that was um, collected by University of Vermont. So the uh, Master Gardeners and the um, Agricultural Extension Services, they all kind of borrow freely. Um, and the information that you'll find on these websites is uh, very accurate and useful. And uh, as George mentioned, why do we compost? Well, um, one reason is, you know, it just makes sense. You, why should you pay somebody to haul away your garbage and then buy compost at the garden center when you can take your own garbage and turn it into compost yourself? Um, it, and it also reduces greenhouse gases. Now, methane is a greenhouse gas that's produced um, in various ways. I mean, methane is a major component of natural gas. It's produced by uh, cows um, when they're digesting uh, greens. And it's also produced in, in uh, landfills. When you drive by the Chicopee landfill, um, you smell um, what's happening there. And a lot of what you see is methane and they burn it off. But um, you know, rather than produce methane that could escape into the atmosphere, why not take your scraps and turn them into something useful and control that aspect of uh, our greenhouse gas production. Methane is a potent greenhouse gas. It's about, uh, I think, six to 10 times more potent than carbon dioxide. Fortunately, it doesn't last as long in the atmosphere, but still, if you can avoid producing uh, methane, it's a good thing to do. Uh, you save money on trash hauling fees. If you have a very small trash barrel, as we do, you know, why fill it up with things that you can manage yourself? Um, it produces a wonderful organic soil amendment, and it saves you money on uh, purchasing uh, growing materials. And why specifically vermicompost? Why would we want to do worms when we could just have a pile out in the yard? Well, the big incentive for me is it can be done indoors all winter. And uh, I, I just think it's great to be able to take the scraps down to the basement, uh, feed the worms. It's very low maintenance and no smell. Um, this is debatable. Um, I think it works faster than traditional composting, but that's because the way I do traditional composting is the lazy man's way. I don't really turn the pile. And so it can take a year to get good compost out of my pile. Um, whereas the worms produce good compost in, uh, you know, weeks to months. And worms do the, the turning. So, you know, lazy man composting, let them do the work. Um, one, a, a few caveats about vermicompost. It's a cold process, unlike outdoor uh, hot composting. So the seeds aren't destroyed. So if you're going to use your worm compost in flower pots or something, you're going to find a lot of tomato seeds and raspberry seeds and all those things that you put in the pile. So if you want to use your vermicompost for gardening outdoors, that's fine. But if you're going to use it for indoor um, gardening, you really want to heat treat it. And the way I do that is I put it in a Dutch oven and I cook it on the barbecue. You don't want to do it indoors because it's smelly. But if you bring it up to 180 degrees outdoors on the barbecue, um, that'll take care of all the seeds. Um, I still have an outdoor compost pile, and that's because I don't put tomatoes in my uh, worm compost. They really don't like the acid uh, fruit. Um, so tomatoes, which you know we use a lot of them in the summer, uh, citrus peels and onions, those all go outdoors. Um, if you're not able to uh, provide some attention to the moisture level and detail, uh, vermicomposting might not be for you. You really don't want to have a wet pile uh, because you're doing it indoors and it could get smelly, but it's not as um, complicated as it sounds. Um, it's pretty easy to keep your, your uh, moisture level correct if you just add bedding when it's starting to get a little wet. Um, 
one of the reasons to have still an outdoor compost pile is uh, you can't handle leaves and grass indoors. The, those things need to be done in an outdoor compost pile. So um, I, I have three acres between an acre and a half here and an acre and a half in East Long Meadow. So I generate a lot of leaves and, uh, and grass and, and I don't pay anybody to take that away. I, I compost it all. So I, I have a pretty big outdoor pile. Um, ingredients for worm composting, the most important one uh, for starting is bedding. And fortunately, if you have a paper shredder, you're probably generating enough shredded uh, paper bedding to keep um, a worm farm happy. You can also use cardboard. Um, you can buy coconut coir, works very well. Um, really not necessary to buy it if you have enough paper. Uh, number two is, of course, your kitchen waste. It helps to chop it up coarsely, uh, but you don't need to. You can put it in whole. And you want to um, use a red wiggler worm rather than um, one of the earthworms that's native in this area. Um, they're easy to buy. If you go um, online, you'll find people selling red wiggler worms for $10 or $20 for a pound. Um, they're used for fishing. And uh, the reason you use red wiggler worms is they compost much faster than earthworms. Uh, the downside with them is they are not um, winter hardy. And so really you should not be using these outdoors or you'll need to replace them in the spring. Uh, but for indoor uh, worm farming, uh, the red wigglers are the way to go. And grit is optional, but I think it's helpful. I like to use ground eggshells because the, um, the calcium in the ground eggshells is just a fantastic amendment to the soil. I have an old uh, coffee grinder that I use to grind up the dry eggshells after they've been um, accumulated and um, it, it helps the worms to uh, digest the food to have a little extra grit in their, um, in their bedding. Uh, you can use sand sparingly, a little bit of dirt. Um, you really don't need anything, but I have read that, um, that the worms don't have teeth, and so having a little grit in there uh, helps them to uh, process the material. Now, the worms don't really eat the waste. They're eating the bacteria and the fungi that um, grow on the waste. So, um, you know, the, they're not going to eat an apple core but they digest the things that are digesting the apple core. And uh, of course you'll need a worm bin. You can do a homemade worm bin. There are a lot of good designs out there. Um, I chose to buy one and there are some advantages to the commercial worm bins. Um, this is a homemade worm bin. You just take two Rubbermaid or, I'm sorry about the brand name, but you know, plastic containers uh, that fit one inside the other. The lower one, you don't make any holes in it, so it collects any liquids that drip through. The upper one, you make holes so that air goes through and water comes out. Um, this is the actual um, bin that I like to use. This one is um, it's called a Worm Factory 360. There are other similar designs out there. Um, this one has multiple trays, and you fill the bottom one, then the second, then the third, and then the fourth. and um, the worms are supposed to migrate up from the bottom to the top. I'll talk a little bit more about um, how to get them to do that. We collect our kitchen scraps in a, in a metal bucket. You can use a plastic pail. Uh, some of you may know my wife is uh, an avid orchid grower and this is a, a Vanda from one of her orchids. Uh, this is my outdoor leaf pile. I have a pretty big one now. You can see it's lined with cinder blocks, uh, grass, flower scraps, tomatoes, onions, and citrus peels go outdoors, but um, everything else goes indoors. Now, this is a very simple solution for outdoor um, composting, and that's just to make a wire cage. You can have one or two of these. Um, you know, if you have one, you just fill it up after a year, pick up the cage, knock off the uncomposted leaves and grass from the top, shovel away the lower, and fill it up again. I've got a 
five minute video um, that I'd like to show uh, to show my actual worm farm. I moved it out of the basement into the sunlight so that you get a best like. And um, I'll give you some pointers on how to manage the trays. I hope this is loud enough. What I'd like to do today is show a little bit about the Worm Factory 360 and how to feed the worms and keep them healthy. Um, when you get a Worm, fac worm Factory 360, you get um, the tray, the stand, a, a lid, um, a container for the liquid that comes out. I think it's useful to get a couple extra things. I like to keep it in a concrete mixing tub, which you can get at a big box store. And I put water in there. And the reason for that is if any worms were to try to escape, they can't get far because they end up in the water. They don't die, but they stay in the water until you retrieve them and put them back in the worm farm. And uh, the other things that it's useful to have handy, occasionally you'll need a bucket. Um, I like to use an aquarium net to uh, filter out the water that accumulates in the bottom. And uh, comes with a, a little scraper so that you can dig down into the into the compost. So let's take a look and see what we've got here. If you uh, take a look here, you'll see I've got some shredded paper on the top. The shredded paper makes good worm bedding and it covers up um, the kitchen scraps and keeps them from smelling. We collect the kitchen scraps until we have a bucket full and then, uh, or, you know, sometimes half a bucket and then just dump them in. And you can see uh, we've got some cantaloupe rinds, some seeds, some, uh, looks like some raspberries um, and coffee and coffee filters. You don't need to separate the filters out. The filters will break down and um, end up as compost. So I usually spread it out a little bit and then add some bedding material on top of it. Tidy it up a little bit. And this is just shredded paper straight from the paper shredder. You can use shredded cardboard, you can use sheets of cardboard, you can use coconut coir. Um, there are various things you can use, but this works just fine. So just spread a little paper in there and you're good to go. Um, I usually keep the lid on. Once that bin gets full and you need a place to put compost, um, in theory, the worms are supposed to migrate up from the bottom into the top bin. In my experience, they tend to stay in the bottom bin. And so I've developed some techniques for trying to get the worms out of the bottom bin so that you can use the compost without losing too many worms. And what I do is I flip the lid over, I take the top bin and put it in there, and then I just stack them up. Now, come take a look at this. You'll see the difference between, this is the fresh kitchen waste with paper, and this is um, kitchen waste that's a few weeks old now. You can see it's turning into nice compost. Um, it still has some uh, worms visible at the top. Next layer down, same thing. There's still some paper visible um, and some bigger particles. And then the layer below that, you can see it's very nice compost. There's no more paper visible, but uh, there's still worms in there. And we, we really don't want to put those worms in the garden. They're not hardy in uh, this environment and we want to try to get them out. So. I take the bottommost layer and I put that aside. And then I put the second to the bottom one back and stack them up again so that now the bottom one will be on top. And what happens here is if you leave the lid off, the top will be exposed to light, which the worms don't like and it will dry out, which they also don't like. And so that will send the worms down into the layers where you want them. And then once this is dry, it's wonderful soil to add to your garden or use in pots around the house. And that's all there is to it. 
that's my little trick for getting the worms out of the bottom layer. They don't usually want to go on their own. Um, you can take a scraper and you can scrape and you can see, yeah, there's plenty of worms here that uh, you don't really want to waste them. Uh, but once this dries out, the worms will go down through the perforations into the next layer and uh, take care of doing the next layer of uh, kitchen scraps. Okay, well, thanks for uh, watching that little video. I, I saw a lot of paper flying around there. You must think my basement's pretty messy, but I, uh, I'm able to control it a little bit down there and I have a vacuum cleaner near the, near the worm bin. Um, so I'm nearing the end of my talk. I did want to mention that the DPW in Longmeadow has some of these worm bins available for residents. They're $25. I recommend you call ahead because they're still not open for business. This is num the number 5673400. They'll get one ready and uh, meet you if you want to pick up a worm bin. Uh, sorry, uh, it, it's not a worm bin. This is a compost bin. This is an outdoor compost bin. I'm sorry about the uh, the mislabeling it there. And uh, that's me. That's my email address. If you have any questions that you uh, think of later, I'll be happy to answer them by email. And again, the uh, the references that I showed you earlier are just two good ones that came up when I searched for composting with worms. And I want to thank you all for your interest in uh, reducing greenhouse gases and managing waste by composting. George and I will be happy to take any questions. Thank you both for those presentations. We have a lot of questions actually from the chat box already. Uh, so I'm going to start with those um, and then um, Actually, I'll, I'll allow everyone to unmute themselves now. So I've turned on the ability for everyone to unmute themselves. So if you have questions or comments, follow-up questions to the ones that I'm going to start with uh, that have come in from the chat box, feel free to jump in with um, any other, any follow-up to them. Um, so one of our earlier questions, uh, George, the sound cut out at one point just for uh, maybe like 30 seconds, um, but we missed the beginning of what not, um, what not to compost. Um, could you review um, maybe the beginning of that list uh, real quick? Yeah. Basically, you don't want to compost any plant material that is diseased because the diseases can carry over to the next year. You don't want to compost um, meats or fat because it will attract critters. Uh, if you've got a big piece of property, you're not worried about critters, you, you can compost meat and fats. But um, typically, people don't like to do that because you get things like rats coming in and that's not good. Okay, uh, thank you for uh, reviewing that. Um, uh, you also had kind of a recipe for compost um, and somebody asked how big is a part? And I think it was just like proportionally like, you know, if you have one part and then double is two parts. Um, but can you go over that again for everyone? Sure, um, yeah, it's two parts brown and one part green and it depends on how much you have. Uh, but basically, if you've got a bucket of green, you put in two buckets of, of brown. Um, and you can find this recipe, well, it'll be uh, in the presentation. You can find it uh, on the web in various places uh, about composting. Uh, but as I say, that, that's kind of the ideal. And if you want to do it scientifically, uh, typically people use what they have and uh, it still works. Okay, great. Um, someone asked, are there any local compost home pickup services like uh, bootstrap compost in the eastern part of the state for those looking for an, an easy alternative? I don't know of any. Do you, Dave? I'm not aware of any. I know there's talk of uh, investigating that, but uh, I think, you know, this is so easy that it's, uh, I don't want to give up my garbage. Um, I know there are, like, if you're looking for just... Um, compost instead of like garden soil. Uh, there are local facilities. I know in Enfield, um, I'm not sure if th this is exactly what you're looking for, but Collins Compost in Enfield um, is a local uh, farm that uses the cow manure and leaves to make their own compost. So there are local businesses, but I don't know about a, a home pickup service um, to take your garbage, um, but there are local compost uh, um, uh, products out there. 
Um, yeah, Collins Compost is a fantastic product and they'll deliver by the yard too. And it's, it's wonderful stuff. Oh, that's great. I didn't know that part. Um, we also had, um, what about using non-organic peelings from non-organic fruits and vegetables? Is there a worry about pesticide or insecticide residue? Absolutely. Um, if we, anytime I talk about organic gardening, you have to remind people that it's not just the stuff that comes out of the can that causes the problem. You got to know where you're getting your, your, your materials from. If you're buying um, any kind of soil amendments, you have to know where they're coming from. If uh, you're using cow manure, you need to know what those cows were eating. Uh, if the cows are not organic, you're, you don't have organic cow manure. It, it's really simple. Um, organic gardening takes a lot of attention and uh, a lot of care at what you put into it. So yeah, that, that is a concern. And if you're using grass clippings, you don't want to um, use any grass clippings that have anything other than uh, straight fertilizer applied to them. So, you know, my neighbors use all sorts of weed killer and I won't use their grass clippings in my compost pile because it does persist and accumulate and it's gonna affect your plants. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, Is does an anaerobic compost pile at home produce methane? It smells, you know, it, I, don't, I don't know whether it produce, they all produce a certain amount of methane, but not a whole lot. What you're smelling is sulfur compounds, usually, which is what the anaerobic bacteria um, produce. Okay. Um, and do inks from shredded paper harm the compost? Mm, again, depends on how a stickler you are for being organic. Um, it's kind of hard, kind of hard to know what uh, particular ink is when you when you buy uh, something that's printed. Uh, most newspapers use soy-based inks these days, but I, I couldn't tell you what the Republican uses. To be honest with you, you'd have to call them and ask. Right. Um, someone said, I regularly get gnats or drain flies that fly around my kitchen. What do I do to prevent them? There is, I, I'm not supposed to uh, talk about particular products, but there are electronic bug catchers out there that work extremely well. I find that if I take the compost out daily, it really helps to minimize the number of uh, flies. So just keeping the garbage out of the kitchen helps a lot. And uh, if you're near Belchertown, Ruby Ranch will take your food scraps for his composting. Um, somebody asked newspaper for worms. I'm guessing, is that okay? Or is that a good idea for to add newspapers to the worm compost? Yeah, you don't need much paper. You know, I... I fortunately shred about the right amount of junk mail and other paper uh, to keep my uh, worms happy. I, I never have the need to shred newspaper, but my sister uses whole sheets of newspaper on top of her worms and that, that works fine too. Um, let's see, someone said, when I have collected worm castings, they would dry up and get hard before I figured out what to do with them. Now I add the worm casting to water, stir it around and pour it on the soil in my garden. Does that sound okay? Yeah, that works fine. That works fine. You can also, as it's drying, you can scrape it with um, the claw and break it into smaller pieces. And then you'll find you get a nice variety of uh, sizes that way. Okay. Uh, when you make the compost tea, is there any benefit to using the compost after it has seeped in the water? Sure. You can take the compost, throw it back in the pile and mix it with the rest of the stuff. Uh, you, you are extracting a lot of the nutrients from it, but it's still got good texture. Okay. Uh, someone said my outdoor compost pile rarely seems to heat up. What am I doing wrong? I think we talked about this a little bit earlier, so maybe we can elaborate on that. Well, basically it has to be big enough, okay? And uh, you have to make sure it's got air and water. Those are, those are the two key things. If it goes dry, it's not going to work. Um, and if it's, if it's uh, not getting enough air in it, then the bugs can't work. So um, those, the, churning it usually is 
the key thing to getting it to work well if, if it's going too slow. Okay. Um, someone said, in the beginning, there was something said about animal waste. I'm particularly speaking of my chicken manure. Is it okay to use? What to do? What to do with it? And is it, what is okay to do with it? You can uh, easily um, compost chicken manure. Chicken manure, it makes a very hot compost because it's got a lot of nitrogen in it. And so uh, it, will it will make your compost pile cook. And that's a good thing. Okay. Um, again, if you want to be organic, you have to think about what you're feeding your chickens, obviously. But um, in fact, yeah, chicken manure is really good. Great. Uh, someone said, coated citrus peels from music sale, okay to use? Coated? The, coated. The coated. Wax, usually, right, Dave? Yeah, I think they're talking about waxed citrus. Um, not every waxy fruit is, uh, is an abnormal or uh, artificial wax. Some apples make their own waxy coating, believe it or not. Um, I don't know about citrus, but um, citrus don't go in a worm pile. Um, I'll throw them in my compost pile, uh, but I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm not what you would consider a strict organic gardener. Okay. Um, and the last question we, question we have in the chat box for the moment is how many worms will you need to get worm composting started? That depends on how much garbage you produce. If, if you want to start slow and only compost a little bit of garbage at a time, then, you know, half a pound of worms should do it. That's, they say there's a thousand worms in a pound, uh, but they reproduce in, in two months, those worms that you have will have doubled in size if they have enough food to eat. So um, for two people, you know, a thousand worms is a good start and it's auto-regulated. If you feed them more, you get more worms. If you feed them less, they slow down their reproduction. Okay, uh, we have a question. Can one vermicompost outdoors? If so, what kind of worms should be used? It's really not recommended. The best uh, worms for composting are the red wigglers and they're not winter hardy. Um, so you would need to get new worms every spring. Um, if you were to use regular earthworms, they don't, um, they don't process the, uh, the matter that quickly. I mean, you'll find worms in your outdoor compost pile, but they're not, they're not doing anything like uh, the red wigglers. They, they, you know, they seem to be able to, uh, you know, I, I fill up that bucket every two days with coffee grounds and uh, butternut squash peelings, apple cores, uh, potato peels. Uh, every two days that bucket goes in the basement and, you know, it, it never fills up because they process it that fast. Um, we have another chicken manure question. Um, mixed with my chicken manure is a hemp material I use because I use a deep litter system where the chicken manure mixes with the hemp. Is that okay, the hemp mixed with the manure when I clean out my deep litter roosting area? Oh yeah, uh, hemp, hemp is a natural fiber. It will compost just like anything else. Um, so it may compost slower because it's a rather uh, tough fiber, but it will compost over time. And uh, when, if, if, if there's a lot of it, then when you go to screen it, you may find pieces of the hemp still there. You throw them back in the compost pile and let them work a little bit longer. <laughs> Somebody asked, how many worms do you have? <laughs> um, I would have to estimate that there's 10 or 20,000 there. No, I, that, that's probably a little high. If it's if it's a thousand worms a pound, <laughs> I probably have a thousand um, times ten, so ten thousand. Yeah, ten thousand worms. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Becky, can, I, can I ask a quick question? Absolutely. Uh, first off, <clears throat> to Lou Cornett, uh, gentlemen, thank you very much, David and George. Uh, great, great information. I think I live in one of the few houses in Long Meadow that has, we are in septic. So we are really trying to find ways of limiting what we put out in the trash. I've got a couple of really good options here. One other quick comment, I was really impressed with the number of people that are trying to only return good things to the soil. 
And one comment was made about tea bags. A lot of tea bags now, especially higher end ones, um, don't use paper anymore. They're using plastic. Mm. So you probably should just be aware of that if you're really concerned about what you put back into the ground. But gentlemen, thank you very much. It was really great. Good point. Thank you, Lou. Do we have any other questions or comments? Either if you would like to turn off your microphone, you're welcome to, um, or you could enter anything into the chat box. A lot of the tea bag plastics are made out of biodegradable tea bags. So it's basically made out of plant material. Mm -hmm. So it depends on what type of plastic it is. Yeah, you, you have a hard, I, I did some checking on that and you have a really hard time finding that out. And biodegradable plastics are a little bit better, but uh, some are blends and they could, as we all know, plastic lasts forever. So personally, I just try and stay away from plastic. Okay, good to know. Thank you. Um, we have a couple comments in the chat. Thanks. This has been very interesting and fabulous presentation. Wonderful information. And I agree. Thank you, both Dave and George. This has been wonderful. Um, very informative. Uh, another thank you. Some waves. Um, I think this was very well received. <laughs> and um, but we do have um, another question of for a composting newbie, which do you rec recommend to start with, vermi or regular composting? It's up to you. Um, a if you have the room, regular composting is really easy. Okay, you make a pile. If you don't have the room, uh, if you're living in a condo or someplace like that, then the answer is vermiculture, uh, obviously. Um, and again, I don't know, I know Longmeadow doesn't have a lot of uh, condos or things like that, but uh, neighborhood associations might be a little sensitive. I don't know. Um, you have to read your homeowner's agreement. But, you know, if you're doing it in a confined area, whether one of the bins or something like that, outdoors is really, really simple to do. Uh, it's a good start. And then you can read up on worms and get going on worms when you feel like it. That's my thought. Yeah, I, I think they're complementary. It's hard to do strictly one or the other. Um, it's a great benefit not to have to go out in the snow in the winter, I can tell you that. Yes, I have a question about that. How do you manage your composting pile if you don't have a container during the winter? Does the snow affect it or do you just have to try to clean off the snow and turn it a lot? I, I don't turn the ones that aren't in containers uh, at all in the winter. Okay. Um, if they slow down, they'll slow down some from the snow because it's cold, but then they'll kick up again. So um, it, a lot depends on how fast you want to compost, basically. Uh, if you want to do compost fast, you get a high tech device. If you want to, if you're patient, you make a pile. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. A um, couple more questions. If you buy one of the worm 360s you showed, how many worms should you buy? I would only buy a pound of worms because they, they'll reproduce. And if you're careful about how much you put in, it, they won't smell. Well, thank you for having us. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you um, for bringing us this presentation. And thank you to Dave, especially who initially asked me about it, um, who asked me about presenting uh, with Stores Library. We have a lot of applause, a lot, um, a lot of applause emoji, emojis um, in the audience. Thanks for being a great audience. The best. Um, yes, thank you very much. We've got a lot of positive comments in the chat as well. A lot of uh, thank you, great information, um, excellent presentation. So this was a great opportunity. Thank you both. Thank you for hosting, Becky. Oh, my pleasure. Right. This was fabulous. Thank you. <laughs> Keep up the good work. Thank you. <laughs>